Blessed be the name of the Lord. Adam, where are you? It's a song by Don Francisco. I had the privilege of shaking his hand one day, and what you'll realize is there are people out there who have not compromised and who didn't take the millions of the music industry and who did not did not compromise their walk with the Lord and this is one one man that didn't and so I really appreciate the music he he has made Don Francisco from his CD he's alive well blessed be the name of the Lord <clears throat> excuse me I'm fighting off a little bit of a bug so <laughs> you'll have to bear with me just a little bit here Brother Stephen is in Houston, Texas. He just concluded a, uh, a meet there, and uh, today I'll be filling in for him, and we'll be covering the topic of prayer. What we'll be talking about will be basically an introduction into what will be a study that will take quite a while to get through, and I'll be posting videos here and there until we get through. When you realize that... <clears throat> Prayer is not just a, an individual thing, as in an uh, encapsulated part of Christianity, but rather it is something that is absolutely and completely inseparable from the Word of God. It is the same. Uh, a good equation or a good, uh, a good example is our ability to understand the difference between soul and spirit. We really can't quite separate the two. And in the same way, the Word of God and prayer are inseparable in that same fashion. There are overlaps. When we study the Word of God, oftentimes we are in prayer. And oftentimes we just can't help it. Because that's how the Lord designed it. The Word of God is communication from the Lord to us. And when we study the Word of God and the Lord has opened our ears to hear from Him, then we are also able to hear communication from Him about His communication through the Word. And so prayer becomes an integral part of the study of the Word of God. And it is something that is misunderstood in a very large way in the church. Oftentimes we use prayer as more of a work. We get down on our knees, we do the actions, we say the words, but there's no communication. There's no real connection with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's what was intended from the beginning, was that we have an open communication with our Creator. That we have the ability and the privilege to walk into His presence whether it's us walking into his presence or his, him walking to us, it doesn't matter which way it goes, but once you're in the presence of God, he wants to talk to us. He wants to communicate with us. And he doesn't want it to be just one way. When our ears are stuffed up and when we're blind, when we're, our eyes have not been opened to the living Word of God and to the open communication that we actually can have. Prayer is just something that we do. It's just something that we do. It's a work. Prayer is a work. But once our eyes and our ears are open, once the illumination of the Holy Ghost is upon us, and once we are able to sit in the presence of the living God and have an open dialogue, then it ceases to become a work and it becomes something that we are and so true prayer friends true prayer is not something we do it's something we be it's something that we are let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 I'll start here just one verse it's good to read Torah on the Shabbat. So Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God 
amongst the trees of the garden. Adam and Eve hid because they had sin in their life, and sin is what separates us from the Lord. They hid <clears throat> when they saw, when they heard, see, they heard, now get this, they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. It didn't say they heard his footsteps. The scripture didn't say that the Lord was jumping around and, or whatever. They heard the voice, the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Who's the voice? Remember John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Or rather, that's verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And to paraphrase so I don't misquote, nothing was created without the Word. And in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Word, the voice. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. This is a communication that God wants with us. He wants to be able to communicate with us one-on-one -on -one whenever He desires to walk into our, wherever we are at that time. And He also wants the door open so that we can come to Him whenever He wants or whenever, whenever we need that time with the Lord. And, and the prayer that we have these days in our churches and in our religious communities, shall we say, has, again, nothing to do with relationship in the sense that we go to the Lord with what we need. But we don't really go to the Lord just to be with the Lord. We go to the Lord with our hands out and we say, I need something. But what about just sharing your heart and speaking to the Lord as he is indeed sitting right next to you. I'd like to share a few things this morning and again this is just an introduction to a topic that is so vast that it will take a good deal of study because prayer is inseparable from the Word of God and prayer is the the window into the spiritual side of Christianity. And so to cover the entire spiritual side of Christianity this morning is just literally impossible. But as we continue this study over the next few weeks, as the Lord gives the opportunity, we'll get into topics such as spiritual warfare. But I won't be able to even start on spiritual warfare until I lay a foundation of scripture showing you what prayer is and what it isn't showing you what is required of us to be able to spend that time with the Lord unhindered we can all go to the Lord of course but able the ability to go into his presence unhindered and the ability for for us to be clean for us to be in a position where we are able to be in the presence of God in such a way that it can change us. <coughs> Excuse me. In such a way that it can help us grow and that it can open doors for us as we grow and mature in the Lord. That's something that has some prerequisites, believe it or not. And that is scriptural. And we'll get into that as we continue this study. But I'd like to share with you a few few things that, that have happened to me. And just consider this kind of a kind of an as a, I keep saying it over and over, an introduction. But in, in a scriptural sense, we could consider this to be the milk of this particular study. And as we go on, it's going to get more intense and more deep in the sense that that we'll have to cut it up and chew it a bit before we'll be able to fully absorb what we're going 
to be discussing, such as spiritual warfare, for instance, uh, which is something that um, something that most people who are involved in that kind of thing do a lot more harm than good. And the reason why they do a lot more harm than good is simply because it has not been studied out in the Word of God, and it has not been it is not put and put in its right place and position in our walk with the Lord. So, before I go on, I want to turn to First Thessalonians chapter five, verse seventeen. Simple verse, very simple, but it has a very large implication. It's something that a lot of people can't fully grasp, and I remember the time when I couldn't grasp it myself. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17, pray without ceasing. I remember thinking to myself, well what do you do? How can you pray and not stop? How can you walk with the Lord with your eyes shut? <laughs> How can you what do you do? Do you, do, you, do you hold one hand up and have one eye shut as you walk around and half bow down? As indeed that is the carnal way of thinking of it, but oftentimes when it comes to spiritual endeavors such as this, we're not able to fully grasp what it means. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That's what Adam and Eve had in the garden. That's why I played those songs when we began. The grand, marvelous, glorious garden that God gave us wasn't really just for us, but it was so that he could walk in anytime he wanted and spend time with us and us with him. And this prayer without ceasing is something that we have to learn over time. What it is, think of a, a child next to a parent. The child over time learns that when the parent speaks, you need to listen. And the parent is there all the time, but the child doesn't always recognize that and doesn't always realize that the parent is there until they need something, of course. Until they need something, then they look up and say, where's mom or dad? Because I need something, so where are they? But the relationship there is in such, such a way that when the parent says, child, so-and-so, the child looks up. And that is a, it is a sign of an open communication because it's not that you are having your head bowed and your eyes closed throughout the day trying to function in that fashion, but rather it's that we have our attention turned to the Lord and able to hear him when he speaks to us. And when he speaks to us, Aaron, turn our head, look up. Say, yes, Lord, I'm here. I remember Samuel in the Bible. He didn't know who was speaking to him. But when he finally found out, and the Lord spoke again, he said, I'm here, Lord. Your servant hears you, and you have your servant's full attention. It's the simple fact that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing, is the ability, the, the, the open line of communication, not necessarily having your head bowed and your eyes closed all the time, that is a part of our prayer with our Lord. But the ability to hear Him when He calls, at any moment, at any time. And this is something that we can't really fully grasp until we have spent a good deal of time with Him. Because the more time we spend with Him, the more we are able to hear his voice. There's a crowd screaming for our attention all around us, all the time. But then the Lord stands there, and as you spend more time with him in prayer and in his word, because they are inseparable, as we spend more time with him, 
then we are able to recognize his voice through all of the distraction and through all of the everything trying to get our attention and pull us away <coughs> we're able to recognize his voice and that's what he wants so that whenever he walks in the room we know he's there and our eyes are on his and that when he walks in the room we look away from everything else even if we're doing his work a lot of people consider doing his work more important than listening to the Lord himself what is the verse I can't remember the reference exactly obedience is better than sacrifice the work that we do for the Lord is sacrifice the work that we do the time that we spend we can't spend any other way we are sacrificing our time and our effort and our 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 personal time our, our personal uh, energy we're, we're, we're sacrificing that to the Lord and that's what we do when we work for the Lord but obedience obedience is better than sacrifice listening to the word of the Lord listening to his communication with us that is better than sacrifice even this time right here I would gladly shut this camera off if the Lord started speaking to me in a very powerful way and said Aaron I got something to tell you I would walk away from this I would shut it down it wouldn't be something that I would hesitate to do because it's something the work that we do for the Lord is our sacrifice our gift to him but the obedience to the call of the Lord Adam where are you don't hide when the Lord calls always set aside whatever is going on in your life whatever you are doing even if it's something he asked you to do even if it's something he asked you to do the work that we do for the Lord is our sacrifice to the Lord but we must be obedient to the call of the Lord whenever wherever it is pray without ceasing something that takes a lot of practice because we have to learn to hear the voice of the Lord now I'm going to be sharing my testimony with everybody kind of in an interview fashion with brother Stephen uh, when we have the opportunity to do it and he knows I've told him uh, my testimony before and we're, we're anxious we're anxious to share it with you but I'm going to touch on a couple small things that is related to that just to hopefully give you a, a little insight a little understanding of some of these things I was saved when I was seven years old I remember very clearly it, it was not it wasn't some big religious experience because when when you're seven years old, life is life, and uh, simple is simple, and, and you know, uh, a box is a box, it's, it's not a cube. You, you know what I'm saying? A box is a box. And when you're seven years old and you, you feel the presence of God come upon you, and all of a sudden you know that that's my creator. That's the guy I should be following. That's my king it's very simple and very straightforward and when that happened to me I just knew I just knew instantly with the purity of a child the innocence of a child instantly knew at that moment that is my king and savior and so I asked him into my life and four years later at a bright old age of eleven we had a I'm going to call it a mini revival the, the Lord the Lord just showed up he just showed up and it was his his desire when I look back on this time it was his desire to, to reach out to the children of the church because several of us during those few weeks were filled with the Holy Ghost I was 11 years old I hadn't even reached puberty at that time and 
I, I find that it's a wondrous thing to grow up being filled with the Holy Ghost. Because when you grow up being filled with the Holy Ghost, he keeps you out of a lot of trouble. Because when the Holy Ghost is in you, you have two choices. Either you do what pleases him or you grieve him. And as a child, grieving the Holy Ghost was something that never even entered my mind. Because we don't want to displease. That's how we're naturally made. We don't want to to make uh, people sad. And so when I was young, the Holy Ghost would, ju would just let me know that you, you shouldn't really be doing that. And so I wouldn't. And it was a wonderful way to grow up. It truly was. But about a week after, a week after I got filled with the Holy Ghost in the same fashion as in Acts chapter 2, about a week after, I was praying at the altar, and, and boy, talk about having a renewed drive to pray and spend time with the Lord. When he comes upon you like that, it just is this, drives you forward. But I was at, I was at the altar and I was praying, and then all of a sudden, just kind of, kind of out of the blue, I heard the Lord, and he said, you're going to be in the ministry. And that was it. As a child, I said, okay, fully accepting it, not really understanding the consequences of such a thing, not really understanding the commitment and the, the cost of being in ministry. And, and really, he didn't ask me. He said, you're going to be. He didn't ask. He said, you're going to be in the ministry. And I said, sure, that's fine. And over the years growing up, I learned here and there that, that there is indeed a cost associated with it. Growing up, I, I determined in my heart from that point on. And now I look back, and, and, and as, a, as a child, you want to please, you want to please the Lord. And so I determined in my heart, I'm going to do everything in my power to prepare for this calling. And so, you know, every opportunity to serve, I did. Every opportunity to, to help out, I did. I, I helped in, in Sunday school. I, I, I helped in the youth as I grew up and was a teenager and such. Then I went off to Bible college, of course. That's what you're supposed to do, right? It was good. But the Lord had other plans. I went to Bible college and did all of that. But... At the end of that time, what happened was uh, circumstances in my life made it to where <clears throat> I moved uh, into my grandparents' house, and I didn't I didn't know it. It, I, it was more of my own selfish thing. But now I look back and I realize that the Lord arranged it so that I could live with them for that year. And what happened was my grandfather was going to a prayer meeting, and the prayer meeting had started out of a sovereign work of the Lord. The pastor was, uh, during offering time or some such, he was walking down the middle aisle of the church. He was going from the front to the back. He was walking down the middle aisle, and then BAM! He flew, full, he flew down the aisle and landed on the floor. Just out of the blue. And you can imagine, everyone was just like, Oh my goodness, what just happened to our pastor? <clears throat> the assistant pastor ran down the aisle. He was at the opposite end of the church. Ran down the aisle and reached down to touch him, to pick him up like, we don't know what's going on. And then smack, just bam, and he was thrown the other way. Landed on the floor. At that moment, nobody touched anybody. Nobody did anything. And the Lord came in that room. And what it was is the presence of the Lord touched them. And they flew and hit the ground. You remember when the guards came up to Jesus in the garden? They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. What happened to the guards when they came face to face with the Lord? They fell back. That's what happened to this pastor. That's what basically launched this prayer meeting. They had a sovereign touch of the Lord. They, they weren't 
really seeking that. Of course, they were open to the Lord's presence because it was a, a Pentecostal-based church. But there's a difference between being open to it and having the raw, the raw experience of the Lord walking in and just going, pink, <laughs> and just putting his hand on you. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, I cannot stand, physically stand in the presence of the living God. So after that, the prayer meeting started, and my grandfather started going to the prayer meeting. He'd been going for a few weeks, uh, maybe a couple months, something along those lines, and he invited me to go. And, and then I ended up living with my grandparents for that year. And what it facilitated was a year of prayer, a year of prayer that I otherwise would not have ever been able to experience. Every day we got up, we had our coffee, and we went to the prayer meeting. And we went to that prayer meeting. I remember the first two weeks. The first two weeks were what I would consider the typical experience of any Christian today. I went in this room and these crazy people, these crazy people would pray for two, three, four, sometimes more hours. And they would seek the Lord and they would pray and when the Lord walked in, time basically stopped. You didn't really know how long you were there. But see, I didn't understand that because I was there in my own carnal nature at that time. I'd go in there, I'd sit down there, and in 10 minutes I prayed over every single person I knew. And <clears throat> I did the, the religious thing. Went through my prayer list. I, I prayed about everything I could think about. And then I just ran out of words, and I'm just sitting here. 10 or 15 minutes and and you know my grandfather drove me so I had no way home and so I sat there and I would just listen to these people worshiping the Lord and they would worship the Lord and worship the Lord like you'd never heard before and the Spirit of the Lord would come into the room some of them would prophesy some of them would have a word of knowledge they they would have something put upon them a, a, a spiritual insight into something that they could never know. That there's no way. There's no way. Oh, we need to call so and so right now. So they pick up the phone and call that person and pray over that person right then. And that person, having absolutely no idea that the Lord was going to have them call, was just ministered to in a way that they had never experienced before because the Lord spoke to the people in the prayer meeting and said, Okay, you need you need to call this person, pray over them. They need something right now. Just a little word of knowledge, just a little this here. Little words of prophecy. And a lot of people don't realize that prophecy is, is a twofold thing. It's, it's future events. Also, um, things that are happening currently it is akin to a word of knowledge, but a little bit different. The gifts were very, very open and very evident. And I, I would sit there and watch them. That, you know, and then I'd bow my head and try and pray for a little bit longer. And that went on for about two weeks. Now, I'd already been filled with the Holy Ghost. And we think oftentimes that being filled with the Holy Ghost is the end-all, be-all. The, the, the I have obtained the, the goal of prayer. I, have, I now have arrived if I've received the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, as in Acts chapter 2. I have arrived, but that is just the beginning. It's just the door. It's just the door <clears throat> into what the Lord wants for us and the communication He wants to open up with us. Even if you've heard the word of the Lord, even if you've heard the very voice of the Lord, that doesn't mean that you're in an open communication with Him. And so I spent this two weeks Every day I went with my grandfather because, you know, he was my grandfather and he asked me to go. So I went. And toward the, the end of the two weeks, I was just like, man, these guys are insane. They just don't stop. 
I don't understand how they can pray for all that time. How can they do that? You know, 10 or 15 minutes and I was done. I was done. And the reason why I was done, because I didn't have that connection and that open line of communication like they did. And so at the very end of the two weeks, I was, as was custom, I was laying on the floor, just kind of just relaxing there, listening to these people worship the Lord. And and then they started worshiping in, in their heavenly language, which is like in Acts chapter 2. And then all of a sudden, something happened. Now, now, I want you to realize there was a time between when I started going and this this thing happened. There was a time, and, and what the Lord is looking for is, is He wants to know that we're, we're dedicated. He wants to know that we will seek Him, even if we have to chase after Him for a while. Oftentimes, we have to catch up to wherever he is. If we're right in step with him, then we don't have to catch up. But if we're not in the position where we're in step, then we have to catch up. We have to take the time to catch up for wherever, to get wherever he is. And the effort, we have to take the effort and the time to get to wherever he is. And then all of a sudden, after two weeks, I could have said no. <coughs> but I knew it was right. I knew there was something there. I knew it inside. I need to be there, no matter how taxing it is to sit there for three or four hours while these guys pray and I do nothing but sit there and listen. All of a sudden, they started worshiping the Lord in their heavenly language. And then it was like something opened in, in, in me and then all of a sudden I started understanding what they were saying and that did two things number one it made prayer and the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the heavenly language real instead of this thing that other people do and of course I had that heavenly language also but when they were praying, all of a sudden, I heard this beautiful worship, and I understood the words of what they were saying. And the Lord just opened it, opened that up. And all of a sudden, you know, oh, how I love you, my King and my God. Wondrous Creator, Master, Savior. They were worshiping the Lord. And then the other person over here would, would continue with this, this poetry, this absolute poetry. Oh, how I love you, my King and my God. Master. Savior. And they would go on and on, and I just was laying there on the floor, and the tears started rolling. Because all of a sudden, I understood. They weren't just saying stuff. They weren't just babbling. They were worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they were worshiping in this poetry that was so beautiful that I could not comprehend it. And the presence of God came and washed over me. And at that time I knew, I understood. This is what I've been waiting for my whole life. Yes, I was saved. Yes, I had received the infilling of the Holy Ghost, but I had not received this. I have not been in the presence of God around people that worshipped, actually worshipped Him in His presence. From that point on, I never stopped. It was a full year, every day. And... After that time when the Lord opened that up and, and my ears were unstopped. And there's a lot more I, I want to share with you about that time. But I said uh, before, uh, we'll do it together uh, with Brother Stephen because it, it's such such a, a powerful thing that, that I want to share. That, that it will be helpful to have him there 
simply because he can ask the questions that I'm sure that I will forget. But after that day when, when I went to the prayer meeting, two hours felt like five minutes. And I finally understood how these people, these crazy people, could spend all of that time in prayer. How they could just sit there or, or stand there and worship God endlessly. Oftentimes we had to tear ourselves away. You know, the pastor would say, well, it's 10 o'clock. I should have opened the office at 9. I'm going to have to go and open the office and answer the phones. The assistant pastor would <coughs> sometimes stay a little bit longer or depending on the day. Sometimes we, we get there at 7. Sometimes we'd leave at noon or 1 or 2. The Lord would speak to us. And the Lord would teach us things. He would open up his word you'd sit there and you'd be praying and then the Lord would bring a scripture to your mind and you'd go and race to your Bible and open it up and at that time I learned you got to have a notepad with you you got to expect the Lord to speak to you so we'd open the word and the Lord would just illuminate it it would be like a big giant flashlight on it and, and you would understand the scripture in a way that you've never seen it before and then all of a sudden, you'd understand what he meant and the significance of it and, and what it means and how to apply it in your life. Portions of scripture that made no sense before were so simple, so, so simple. And it was because prayer and the word of God are inseparable. They're like the soul and the spirit. We as human beings, we cannot find the dividing line between the two. We cannot. We pray the Word of God and the Word of God comes into us as we pray. The Word of God comes to our mind as we pray and then we pray the Word of God. There, there's no separation between the two. So the Lord would open up the Scripture and He would open up different things and, and He would teach us and He would guide us. It would be probably, if I look back, it would probably be an average of maybe three hours a day. And that was just at the prayer meeting. And like I said, it's, it's not the time that's spent. It's who you're spending it with. And the moment that's open up to you, once you, as my grandfather said over and over, he said, you have to pay the price. The price for me was the two weeks Two weeks of sitting there with the added benefit of, of, of going with my grandfather that made it where it was easier, but I knew I was supposed to be there, and I knew it was a choice. I knew I could just walk out that door. I knew that the Lord was there, but I could not feel it. I could not perceive it in and of my own self, and my grandfather said, we have to pay the price. Once we pay the price that the Lord wants of us, then we receive what we ask. I remember, yes, I was very, very young, but I remember as a child I had learned these colorful new words that are not pleasing to the Lord. And I remember I just knew in my spirit, I knew, if I can break this habit, he'll fill with me with the Holy Ghost. So I broke the habit. And then he filled me with the Holy Ghost. There's a price. He wants to know that we are diligent and dedicated. He asks of us. You take the time. Get on your knees and seek him. And he will show up. It may take a few weeks. It may take enough time to tear your stony heart open so that you can actually feel his presence. To tear the stones and the calluses and all of that off of your heart. But when we're in the right place and when the Lord sees that we are indeed chasing after him, 
and he'll let us catch up. And when you catch up, and when you find out, when you're in his presence like that, you are never the same. When you walk out of his presence, you are a different person. Whoever you were on the inside ceases to exist. I, I look back on that time, and I see it as the beginning for, for my walk with the Lord. Even though I was saved, even though I had spent my entire time growing up filled with the Holy Ghost, I don't count it as my time with him in the same way. Because once we spend time with the Lord in his presence, nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. Pray without ceasing, it says First Thessalonians. That is not something that we can do in and of ourselves. As I go through this study, uh, the next time I speak on this subject, it will be a very uh, in-depth scriptural view of what prayer is through the Word of God. This individual prayed this way, this other individual prayed this way, and what were the common threads throughout, and, you know, and answer the questions like, how many times a day should we pray? <laughs> should it be once a week? Should it be once a day? Should it be twice a day, three times a day? Well, this scripture right here in Thessalonians says pray without ceasing, but it's impossible for the carnal individual, the, 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 the individual themselves, to pray without ceasing, without the Lord himself connecting to them. Once that door is open, and the line of communication where you've got one eye on the Lord all the time, one ear on the Lord all the time. Once that is understood and once we're to a point in our walk with the Lord that that is applicable, then we can pray without ceasing. Once we understand that prayer, prayer is not something we do. It's something we are. Once that is understood, once that spiritual revelation is made clear, then the scripture here, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing, becomes applicable. We pray without ceasing once we become what we are to become. Now as I look back, that prayer meeting, that, that moment two weeks in, was when, when I became who I was supposed to be. And from that point on, the line of communication has been open. And that's the same thing for Brother Stephen too. Because the Lord speaks to him the same way. And when he opens up the word, things just jump off the page. <laughs> and he catches it. And he catches it. And then he gives it to you. That's all he does. That's all I do. As the Lord opens up the word. We give it to you. So I'd like to encourage you, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek his face. Chase after him. Chase after him. You'll know when you caught up, because you will never be the same from that point on. When you catch up with the Lord, when you start to walk in step with Him, it 
it's life changing. You'll never be the same. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> and there's my little ding there, email coming in. Remember, you can always contact us and ask questions. Uh, anything else you would like to do at contact at israelreturns.com. It usually comes through me, and when there are things I am not able to answer, I'll send it to Brother Steve or, or things that are um, specifically for him. And I try and I try and lift a little bit of the burden off of him so that he's able to minister and do what he's been called to do. And so as you send email in, I'll see it first usually uh, when it comes in through contact at israelreturns.com. And uh, I just wanted this, this message to be an encouragement to you all. We seek the Lord while he can be found. And one last little tip before I wrap this up. God himself, three times in scripture, says a very key and very important thing. And this is what will open the door in prayer for you. This is what will do it. This is what will open up that walk with the Lord. He says, Be ye holy, because I am holy. That's the key. You walk away from the world. You get right with God. You wash yourself off with the Word of God, as it states in Ephesians, washed in the water of the Word. <coughs> and then, then be ye holy, separated, set apart. That's why the Lord walked in after two weeks, because I set that time apart. That was the price that had to be paid. We set ourselves apart. Be ye holy. It wasn't a request. It was a command. Be ye holy. Let's pray. Thank you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, for this day. And for opening up your word and for bringing your presence to this service today. Lord, I ask for everyone who sees this. I sensed you stirring the hearts of your people. The churning inside. I ask, Lord, pull back the restraints and hold back the enemy that they all may be able to set some time aside to chase after you. That we may chase after you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If today you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, and you know right now, you just know, inside. It's time. Don't hesitate. The scripture says if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is Yeshua, that Jesus is Lord and has raised from the dead. If you just know it <coughs> and can confess it, then you will be saved. And if you do that, make sure you email me. Contact at IsraelReturns.com We'll help you get on the right foot on your new chapter of life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God bless. We'll talk to you again later.